Beautiful, taking a deep breath in and letting go. So for those of you who have your hand out, go ahead and flip it to our blank side. <laughs> I literally have nothing written down, but that does not mean we're not gonna write stuff down. Since we did our summer solstice workshop, I all my energy went into writing for that. So normally you have handouts on the very back. Normally it's on the inside and we fill the inside, but today, since we have a very long song, I put the lyrics of the song on the inside. So you'll just flip to the back side and that's where we're gonna take our notes. Sound good? And so for the sermon of the week, you could put at the top, um, we're gonna title it, How We Heal the World. How we heal the world. Do you want a little pen and parchment? Yeah, it's, it's right here. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So how we heal the world. Let's go ahead and just take a moment and breathe that in. And we're going to go ahead and write down the three bullet points because that's all that's on the paper right now. And the first bullet point we're going to be putting healing ourselves. The second bullet point is going to be healing our relations. And the third bullet point is healing our footprint. And so we're just going to go, we're going to go ahead and just, you can set those packets down for just a second because I'm going to do a quick recap for those at home and for those of you who are new today but we're gonna be going over the living peace code, which is since, how long has it been? Yeah, six, about seven years now I've been teaching this because I was teaching this a little bit before I actually published the book, Living Peace. But the living peace code, I bring it up every single Sunday, but it's something that we have based our foundation on. It's nine tenets on how to cult inter cultivate inner peace within our lives. The first three teachings are all about self-mastery, the second three teachings are all about piercing the illusions, our own delusions of when we're interacting with others and in the world. And the final three are all about relinquishing our attachments. Because when we have our attachments, who's ever been attached to something and it has caused you suffering? <laughs> it could be, I've talked about this yesterday, but it could be when you're in love with someone and love, who's ever had love make you crazy? <laughs> That's an attachment. Love itself, <laughs> oh my, <laughs> love itself does is not crazy making, but sometimes our own neurosis around it. Who's ever had an addiction, right? Who's ever been attached to an identity that you've had or a belief system? So there's all types of things, even sentimental items, right? And so there's all these things that we learn and it sounds kind of scary when you get to the final teachings, but it's really, it's not about letting go of people or things. It's learning to let go of your attachments to them so that you don't suffer from them. Does that make sense? So let's go ahead and take a deep breath in. So with today's sermon of how we heal the world, we're gonna be breaking down the living peace tenets with the three bullet points that we talked about. And so under healing ourselves, go ahead and put three bullet points. And the first three bullet points are going to be mastery of thought, Mastery of impulse and mastery of emotion. Mastery of thought, mastery of impulse, and mastery of emotions. And so, in the Living Peace Code, the way we recite it every single morning is. I am the master of my life. I master my thoughts. I master my impulses. I master my emotions. So let's now break that down. Does anyone here struggle with negative thinking sometimes? <laughs> or anyone at home? That is a very common issue. I would say it's probably one of the greatest, what's the word I'm looking for? One of the greatest obstacles humanity faces is that we are enemies with our mind. And here in the West, we're never really taught, like of course in uh, Eastern religions, there's a really big emphasis on learning the, the conscious and the subconscious mind, learning about the ego. They might have different words for it, but there's so much emphasis on understanding and figuring out what's going on up here. In the West, there really isn't too much, even in our modern therapy, 
a lot of times, you know, they'll just give you a pill for something, but they're not actually, a lot of therapists don't take the time to go into the subconsciousness and figure out, well, why are, why do these thoughts exist and how are these thoughts negatively impacting your life? And again, I mean, this is from firsthand experience because as a child, I suffered from clinically diagnosed um, depression. And then we, they would, my parents would just hop me from psychiatrist to psychiatrist. <laughs> no offense, I mean, it's true. Just speaking facts, no judgment. But none of them were really taking the time to understand where these roots of neurosis were coming from because I also had major OCD and, and uh, social anxiety. So that's neurosis. And I just, for whatever reason, just as I was aging through that middle part of my childhood, just it, the negativity continued to stack on top, stack on top, stack on top, stack on top. And then once I started studying Buddhism and meditation and some other self-help books that literally all I had to read once upon a time was, you are the master of your mind. And that just, boom, a flip went off, a switch went off in my head and I'm like, hot damn. I do not have to believe the things that are going on in my head because a lot of what we're thinking in our mind is just opinion, it's just projection. It might even be belief systems or opinions from outside influences, other people that are judgments that then you accept as your own truth. Societal expectations, who feels expectation from other people? Or who, who, who gives rent free rooms in your head to people you don't prefer? <laughs> <laughs> right and it's just they're just there there's these chat it's just chattingness up here and in Indonesia in living peace we learned to associate differently with our mind and we learn about the consciousness we learn about the subconscious and we learn about the ego and it's not in my first edition it's not in my first edition of living peace but it's in this one where I talk about the three aspects of ego how we can, how we're pushing against things, how we're grasping for things, and how we're holding on to things. And anytime we're caught in those three aspects, it creates a lot of suffering for ourselves. So that's what's so beautiful and why mastery of thought is the very first tenet because thought, I'm sure some of you have heard this before, thought is a building block of reality. Thought is a building block of reality. But let me break this down for those of you who might be new. Thought is a building block of reality because when you consistently think a thought, it starts to turn into a belief system. It starts to turn into an expectation of reality. And when you start to have expectations of reality, you're gonna to start to associate differently with the world around you. And when you're associating differently with the world around you, you're gonna start having more emotions about things. You're gonna start having more judgments about things. When you're having these emotions and these judgments, it starts to influence your relationships, right? And so the, the relationships that you're influencing goes into your marriage, goes into your work life, goes into every which way that you're interacting with the world because the world is filled with relationships. So all of a sudden, it then starts to uh, influence your full character. It starts to influence the full reality that you're experiencing. And all of a sudden, thought has become reality. Does that make sense? And so that's why it is so absolutely critical that we do not take ourselves too seriously and that we're always questioning what's going on up here. And not just, one of my favorite quotes from my book is, just because I have a thought or feel a feeling, it does not automatically make it true. Just because I have a thought or feel a feeling does not automatically make it true. Interesting, isn't it? Let's take a breath. <clears throat> So that then beautifully goes into mastery of impulse. Once we start to understand what's going on in our mind, we start to pay more attention to our impulses and our addictive behaviors and our, react our reactory behaviors. Who sometimes has impulses or speaks before thinking, right? That's another issue a lot of people have. You might just spout out a judgment accidentally. You might do something in haste accidentally. You might be working on some addictive behavior. And again, it doesn't have to be some major drug addiction. It can literally just be a, a slight addiction to food. It could be slight addiction to watching too much TV, scrolling through social media. It can be something slight. It doesn't always have to be something extreme, but just things that you do without thinking. Does that make sense? And so then in Dunisha, we learn to cultivate that power. And then comes the emotions. With the help of our impulses, with the help of our thoughts, we then pay closer attention to our emotions. Because a lot of times, we have a thought, we have an impulse, boom, we do something, and then we get into full-blown full emotion around it. Anyone do shit and then you feel guilt afterwards? <laughs> Anyone do stuff and then you feel much more anger about it because you were beating that drum, beating that drum, or you were having a strong uh, conversation with a loved one, right? 
but then you in your impulses you get even more heated and you're beating that drum beating that drum and then you have just built up so much steam that there's no slowing down that engine of negative emotion right until it runs its course and so again in Dunisha we learn to quell those emotions so that we can have an uh, so that we can practice tranquility and equanimity and keep a serene peace of mind no matter what is occurring around us. You know, there's one of my favorite sayings is that it's conditions don't matter. It's our state of being that matters. Because if we're always saying it's the condition or outside me that matters, then you're always going to be reacting to the condition outside of you. But when you learn to live an unconditional life, you can say conditions don't matter. It's my state of being that matters. And that way, Anytime there is a condition outside of myself that might be difficult to struggle, that might be, I might be struggling with, I can respond to it rather than react to it. So that's how we're healing ourselves. So the, those three tenets, that's what we wrote down right there. That's how we learn to heal ourselves because we have to heal our thoughts, we heal our behavior, and we heal our emotional state of being. And once you do those things, then you move on to the second tier of the living peace code, which are the three illusions. Let's take a breath. So go ahead and write this down. These are a little bit longer than just masteries. So the first one is ignorance is an illusion, comma. Ignorance is an illusion, comma. We seek understanding. Ignorance is an illusion, comma. We seek understanding. And so what that means is that there's a lot of willful ignorance in our lives. Any times we just view things as black or white, we just view things as cut and dry. We're not taking the time to explore and to educate ourselves and to go deeper into, why do I have this feeling? Why do I have this belief? Do I have this thought or this belief because it's just what I've always known? Or have I actually done deep research behind it and really questioned myself, right? And so it's really interesting about this is ignorance is illusion, we seek understanding, and that in Indonesia, especially when we're wearing the robes, we do our damnedest to constantly cultivate understanding in all interactions. Even if something seems cut and dry, we take our time to seek understanding. And as a therapist myself, I have to freaking do that, right? That is my number one job because I never know who's going to come and sit on that couch. And they might have done some really, really violent, harmful things but it is still my job to cultivate compassion and understanding for them because it is my job to help lead them to healing. If I just had my own preconceived notions of who this person was or because they did X, Y, Z behavior that I just labeled them as bad and wrong and that's it, no healing would occur. And so our call to action in Dunisha is learning to take that therapy, therapist-like energy and apply it to all of our interactions. Does that make sense? To be that neutral presence so that we can then learn and cultivate understanding even when there has been harm. And of course, as, we, as we're learning, the only way to actually heal deep harm is to under, cultivate understanding and to help other people feel understood, to feel heard, to feel listened to, to feel appreciated, to feel sometimes even validated in their own pain. Does that make sense? So let's take a deep breath. And then we move on to the next one, which is number five, the second bullet point, <clears throat> which is chaos is an illusion. Chaos is an illusion, comma. We seek harmony. We seek harmony. Chaos is an illusion, comma. We seek harmony. And so within this tenet, it's really interesting because it kind of goes with our second tenet of impulse control, right? Of mastery of impulse. Who's ever just seen chaotic things? Who's ever been in a chaotic situation or especially recently been watching the news and there's just so much chaos, right? And so it's very easy when we say chaos within ourselves, within our relationships, within the world, to just block it out, to just say that is wrong, that is bad. And we, again, we put up that barrier again. But in Dunisha, we learn to see beyond the chaos. We learn to find the harmony within the chaos. 
kind of like that quote that Andrew Ock often talks about where, you know, anytime there's violence in the world, always look for the helpers, right? Something akin to that. There's always a harmony bound and there's always a way that even when there is a tornado swirling around us or a hurricane, that's more of an accurate because they have the eye. Even when there's a hurricane, we can learn to be that center point. We can be the eye of the storm so that we can be still within it. And then when we're looking out, yes, there might be those conditions that are whipping around, but that doesn't mean that we cannot have peace within ourselves. And so one of the first quotes I ever heard by Thich Nhat Hanh, I'm not going to get it perfectly, but it was something akin to, you know, peace is not dependent upon the conditions of the world. It's literally learning to have peace within ourselves no matter what. And so how many people have ever said that? You know, I, I'll have peace once I get this done. <laughs> you know, I'll have peace once, you know, I graduate or once the kids are out of the house or once, you know, this really uh, stressful week at, the, at work is uh, completed or once I'm on vacation. There's always this next thing. Well, I'll have peace once. I'll have peace when. But we just keep pushing it out. We keep pushing it out. So in Dunisha, we really challenge ourselves. And we say, there is no tomorrow. You know, we are learning to cultivate this peace now, no matter the condition. Powerful stuff. Really difficult to do. But with the teachings, it, it, gives, a, it gives a journey and a pathway from which we can achieve it. And we do our best to live it every single day. Not perfection, of course, but we really do practice that. So let's take a breath and we'll move on. The next one is a very difficult one. And it's one that we sometimes lose students over because it really challenges our belief systems. And so this is number six or number three in this a second tier. And this one is called duality is an illusion, comma. <coughs> Duality is an illusion, comma. We seek transcendence. Duality is an illusion, comma. We seek transcendence. And so duality is this idea of right, wrong, good, bad, where we really feel that there is this black or white way of looking at life. And some religions teach this, you know, there's a heaven and there's a hell. There's evil and there's righteousness. There's good, there's bad, there's right, there's wrong. And our culture has just been really, really taught this for a very long time. But in Dunisha, we learn that that mode of thinking is really extra, extra, extra harmful. <laughs> because who has ever felt guilty about something, right? You felt like you've done something bad or wrong, but then in your guilt, you have felt even worse, and in feeling worse, you may then actually become more addicted to a substance to take the edge off, or when you're feeling worse, you might be more irritable, and you might snap at your loved ones. And so what's interesting is that when people do things that are in non-alignment that we might be saying, we need to fix this, a lot of times punishment comes down and judgment comes down, right? But as we have learned, especially in psychology, Kids that are beaten <laughs> generally grow up. I don't mean to laugh, but kids that are often beaten generally learn up and don't know how to actually healthily integrate harm. They do not know how to healthily integrate their emotions and to express them. Instead, when we meet violence with punishment, what we're often teaching is further violence and punishment. And I've worked with people in prison systems. I've worked with people who have suffered sexual abuse, physical abuse, growing up, all types of abuse. And it's interesting is that any abuse that we put on top of abuse just leads to further abuse. Does that make sense? And so what we learn to do is we learn to cultivate understanding. We learn to cultivate harmony and we teach the lessons of mastery of thought, impulse, and emotion rather than instantly going to judgment, going to right, to wrong, to good, to bad. Because guess what happens when you label someone as bad for long enough? Eventually they start to believe that story within themselves and it becomes so much more difficult to transcend that. When you're, for example, my favorite example I give to people, because obviously with smoking, we don't, we don't ever say that that's bad for you. 
because when you say smoking is bad for you, we know that it's harmful for you, right? We, we know scientifically that it's harmful for you. So we would say smoking is harmful for you, but we would never tell a child that is bad for you and you're wrong to do that. Because unfortunately what happens with their mind, a lot of times psychologically, then they might start saying, well, if I'm doing this thing that's bad or wrong, then I must be bad or wrong. Do you see how that happens? But when you simply say, this is harmful for you and it might have health effects in the future, you're not making it about their identity and there's no way of mistaking it for their identity. Does that make sense? So you see the power of semantics, you see the power of words when you're saying this is wrong and this is bad or goodness forbid you say you're a bad child. <laughs> Well, just send them to me in 20 years. <laughs> but you see the power of words. And in Indonesia, we really do our best to not get caught up in calling people or belief systems bad or wrong. Because we know that when we do that, we're being lazy. Because it's so easy to just say, oh, that's bad, that's wrong, and they have nothing to do with it. But when you actually have to take to explain it, take the time to explain why we're taking a stance on things, it makes more sense. Such as just saying, that's bad, don't do it, versus actually explaining. You know, it's, it's in your best interest not to do this because it will lead to additional harm in your future. You see a long sentence there <laughs> versus a short sentence, and when you're really worked up, you go for the short sentence because it's easier to do. Does that make sense? This is just a very simple introduction to duality. In Dunisha, we go much deeper into it because it becomes a belief system that we really hold and we live and breathe. Because again, when I'm sitting with people in a therapy session and they might've done some very violent things, if in my head I'm judging them as bad or wrong, there's no way in hell I'm gonna help them. Does that make sense? So we learn to take that energy out into every interaction that we have. Let's breathe that in. And now we're gonna move on to the final three teachings. The first one is release the mundane. Release the mundane. The second one is release knowing. Release knowing. And the third one is release self. Release self. <clears throat> and these all have to do with our attachments. So when we release our attachments to the mundane world, we're learning to release attachments to materialism in particular. We're learning to release attachments to sometimes even achievements. We're learning to release attachments to all these ideas that we feel like make up the mundane world that make up who we are. Does that make sense? And this can be very difficult because a lot of times we place so much emotional energy into what we have created, the castles that we have built in this lifetime. But Pema Chodron, which is a Tibetan Buddhist nun in the um, tradition of Chogyam Trungpa, the Shambhala tradition, she once made, um, again, I don't have the quote perfectly, but she said, life is like building a sandcastle in the sand. And every, and every so often the tide rolls in and washes it all away. And you're gonna suffer immensely if you have built an attachment to that sandcastle. But if you're able to recognize that life is temporary and everything is impermanent, you are able to have much more peace in your life and you can recognize that it's, yes, it's wonderful to build things, but we mustn't lose our emotional well-being over them when they fade. Does that make sense? And so that's just kind of a perfect analogy for releasing the mundane, just a simple introduction of it, but just viewing life as a sandcastle that we have built in the sand and that eventually the tide rolls in and then a tide rolls back out and we can't get so angry about things when that happens because it's the very nature of our existence. Deep breath. And then we have release knowing, which is another big one that a lot of students get caught up in. I mean, students get caught up in all of them, but this is another one that sometimes really happens as well. Release knowing is that who's ever learned stuff? <laughs> who's ever had an achievement? Who has ever really created identity about having some kind of knowledge or belief system? 
Again, this can go into religious beliefs, political beliefs, cultural beliefs, even just what it means to be a man or a woman. And we have these ideas of the world. We have these ideas of the world and we say, I know. <laughs> I know that those two words, or I know that already. So not only does that happen on a big scale with religion, politics, culture, all that fun stuff, but it also happens in stifling people's healing. Because I can't tell you how many times this has happened where people sit on the couch and then we're going through some healing process and then they say, oh, I know that already. <laughs> I would say this has probably happened at least once in every single session I've had, or at least in every single, every person's healing journey, because we normally do multiple sessions. Oh, I know that already. And that is such a harmful thing to say because it is so dismissive. And it's not even about anyone else other than their own individual journey, because here's the thing, when we say I know that already, it's a lie. Because if we knew it already, we wouldn't be in therapy. <laughs> we wouldn't be learning something new. We wouldn't be relearning something because we're there to learn. But when we say I know that already, or I know that I have that issue already, it's how I always often teach people to say is transform it to say, I'm aware of this issue, but I'm not yet fully practicing on it. I'm not yet fully practicing it because one of my favorite quotes from Living Peace is to know is to do, to know is to do. If you fully knew it, you would be doing it. But instead, it might just still be in its incubation period of awareness, and it's not yet actually turned into knowledge. Does that make sense? And so in uh, Shunryu Suzuki was one of the first Japanese Zen masters to come to America. And one of his favorite, uh, one of his favorite quotes is, in the, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. And he taught that it's vastly important to always keep a beginner's mind because once you start to think that you know, you start to close off to more information coming in and you might get even lazy with your practice. So in Dunisha, we learn to visit the teachings every day with the fresh eyes. As if I have freaking said this code and probably read it at least 5,000, 10,000, I don't even know, so many times. But every day, it's my opportunity to look at it for the first time and that keeps it fresh. And so the first eight teachings are all, or the first seven teachings, the tenets are all about gaining knowledge, but then you get to eight and it's like, release it and start fresh. And that's what keeps us humble. That was, that's what keeps us in humility. And so we then actually achieve some knowledge. And then in the final teaching, which is release self, you transmute that into wisdom. And so let's take a breath and we'll talk about release self. <clears throat> Release self, it might take your whole lifetime to master this tenet, and that's okay. This isn't some Western get the degree and to uh, get the certificate in a weekend workshop. Because <laughs> that happens. In America, we love our instant gratification, damn it. And unfortunately, that is very not useful to our own growth. And so release self is ultimately your identity. Who this person is, who this Alaric is, am I actually Alaric? No. Am I Kyle? No. Am I Hutchinson? No. Am I a Zen teacher? No. Am I an author? No. And here's the fascinating thing, all these things that I'm saying no to, it's a half-truth. Because yes, I have created these identities for myself, and I am Alaric, but it's a half-truth. There is so much more to me than these labels. And so when you look at someone, right? When you look at someone, you have an idea of who they are, but that is just your projection of who you think they are. Every single person in this room has a different relationship and idea and being of Alaric in their mind. If I went into each and every single one of your minds and I found the file of Alaric <laughs> and I took it out and it became a hologram and I looked at myself, I would be completely different. So there are as many Alaric Hutchinsons on this planet as, as there are people who have met me and there are as many realities coexisting on this planet as there are people alive. So if I got to meet every person, all the 7 billion people, there would be 7 billion Alarics. Which one is right, which one is wrong, doesn't matter because every single person has their own idea and because it's their own reality, they are going to respond to it as if it is real. 
And so even my own perception of who I am is a half-truth. It is all half-truths. And so when we learn to live our life in this way, hot damn, it's hard, but it also makes us have so much more peace because we stop sweating things. We stop sweating the, what is that saying? Sw small stuff. The small stuff, thank you. I'm like, the hard stuff? No, it's the small stuff. <laughs> right? And who has suffered because you've become so attached to your identity? But here's the flip side. All prejudice, racism, all types of hate, all types of judgment exists because of our attachment to others' identities, right? And so we get so caught up in the mundane reality of this planet that we're so, we get this narrow vision and we just say, that's who they are, or that's who I am. Because so much of the healing work behind the scenes is cultivated into who we are. And a lot of us have insecurity and self-worth complexes. But that's not necessarily true, is it? It's just an idea of our identity that we've attached to that is not necessarily true. Interesting, isn't it? So you have released self. Let's breathe that in. So those are the nine teachings of Dunisha, of living peace. And as you can see, you start with, we start with healing ourselves. And then we have healing our relationships, healing how we're interacting with the world. And then finally, we conclude with healing our footprint. Because when we release our attachments to life and to our things, it really does make us start to walk this life, walk this planet with a softer footstep. And we stop trying to just consume life. And we might be much more in the likelihood of giving back to life and causing less harm. A favorite quote of mine in Living Peace is, you cannot become selfless until you fully understand yourself. Because the goal is like that Mother Teresa archetype of becoming a selfless servant, being able to just give, you, uh, give of yourself, right? But a lot of times, who's ever given you got drained? <laughs> or you get upset because the people who you're giving to are not appreciating it. That's how you know you have not fully understood yourself because you're still attached to yourself because you're making it about yourself. Interesting, isn't it? So these nine teachings are quite literally a pathway on learning how to achieve enlightenment within ourselves. And my definition of enlightenment is consistent inner peace. Being able to associate with the world from a place of not doing harm and from a place of being able to keep your own alignment, if you will. So let's take a breath. And that is our talk for today, the Sermon of the Week, how we heal the world, and we heal the world through taking this journey through the nine tenets. And what's fascinating is once you get to release self, it's a circle, it's not a ladder. You start back over with mastery of thought. Because if you view it just as a ladder and then you get to the top and you're like, I did it! You're probably just going to put that down and be like, well, that's it. And then you move on to the next shiny thing. But in living peace, we recognize that it's a circle that we continue to come back to because if you do not foster these teachings every single day, they don't exist. All that exists each day is what you activate in your consciousness. So if you're not activating peace, peace does not yet exist. Does that make sense? And you're more likely to just react to whatever the conditions are. And so that's why it's a circle and we continue to revisit it. We continue to activate it. So on that note, let's take a deep breath. And we say thank you. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. For those of you YouTubers, that was interesting. We just ended at 3333. Very cool. So for those at home watching, links are down below. If anyone would like to either pick up a copy of Living Peace or become a student or just donate, which we deeply appreciate donating to the Church of Dunisha. Thank you very much. Blessed be.